So we're uh, now into the second uh, message in our series from uh, the seven churches in Revelation. Last week we began, but it wasn't, we didn't look at the church, any of the churches. We looked at the, the, the teaching in the first chapter of Revelation that here as we gather, the risen Christ standing in the midst of the church. And we need to be aware of that today. Uh, I, I, we need to be aware of it always that when we gather together, we are gathering in the presence of the risen Savior. And he stands in all of his authority and all of his power in the midst of this place. Um, and so we also thought last week of the voice of Christ, this great thundering voice that does indeed break, or will indeed break open the graves when he returns. But this, this voice that thunders like many waters, as he stands in the midst of us, um, we're told that he will sing praises in the midst of the congregation. Now we know that even if that is a projection to the future in the great congregation, we are a representation of that great congregation and our savior is here and his voice must be heard. And we're thrilled at that, aren't we? We marvel at that here in this church, that almighty God is not only here, but he's here to speak. And he's here that we may hear his holy voice. Today, we're going to begin by uh, looking at the first letter. Um, we're going to begin the series uh, proper, if I can say that, by looking at the letter to the church in Ephesus. Uh, this church is possible for us to describe So it's possible. I'll do my best as Kenny replenishes my power. Aren't you? and can do in order to give us power. Thanks, Kenny. We have a power from God that can never, ever um, be lost. How beautiful is that? that? That wonderful presence of Christ. Anyway, this church in Ephesus could be described uh, as perhaps like no other church in that the heritage of this church in Ephesians, uh, the, in Ephesus, um, was a, a heritage that, is, that was precious in that it was the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul and Priscilla and Aquila who brought the gospel to Ephesus. They are the ones who brought the gospel in and we read that in Acts chapter 18. But not only did they bring in the gospel, the, this church in Ephesus was also blessed by the, the special preaching of Apollos. He came with his power and he preached the gospel there and was instructed in a more complete knowledge of God. And not only did this take place in Ephesus, but this was the groundwork, if you like, for Paul's own ministry there. Paul had three years of continual ministry in the church of Ephesus. You imagine that. Imagine sitting every time we gather under the ministry of the Apostle Paul. What a grounding this church received. And it was a far-reaching ministry. It went beyond Ephesus, the, the, the influence of it. And miracles and wonders attended the preaching of the Apostle Paul. And that's found in Acts 19. 
Paul in Ephesus for three solid years of ministry. Well, by the time this letter was dictated by the risen Christ, something like 40 years had elapsed since Paul. Paul was gone. Maybe those that Paul had instructed had gone. The situation in Ephesus wasn't the same anymore. It wasn't the, it wasn't the way it used to be. And they had got to the stage where the head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ, found it necessary to dictate another letter. Wow. I mean, that's awesome. Here is Christ now ready to speak to this church directly. But you see, there was an issue that he wanted to address. It wasn't a general letter that he was writing or he was dictating to John. This was something Christ had noticed, something that he was aware of, something that he knew. And before he says what it is, it's really important to see that he underlines his absolute authority to tell them. In verse 1, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand. Remember, we thought of the, the Savior holding the Lord God the Lord Jesus Christ holding the seven angels of the churches in his hands. We thought of the leaders of the church, but more, most particularly the, the pastors of the church held in the right hand of Jesus Christ and how that is true of every single fellowship throughout all the ages. He says, it's me who's going to speak. It's me who holds the pastor of the church in my hand. I control him. I have authority over him. Therefore, I have authority over the fellowship. He says, these are the, the things that saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. He's walking in the midst of the golden candlesticks, which are the churches. And so here is the one with all authority, walking in the midst of his people. We marveled that we were told earlier that he was, he was standing in the midst of his people. But here we're told that he's walking in the midst of his people. That's an amazing picture, because what we have is the Lord Jesus Christ, risen and in all his authority, walking around within the churches. In other words, do you remember when Jesus went into the temple and he looked around and then the following day he came back and he dealt with the issues that he had witnessed or that he had seen. What we have here is a picture of Almighty God in the person of Jesus Christ walking in the midst of his church, surveying the church. And when he starts to speak to the church in Ephesus, he's going to tell them something, something really serious that he has been aware of. And he has all authority to address. The people in the, the temple asked him, where do you get this authority? Who do you think you are doing all of this and casting out the, the, the moneylenders and the traders? Well, here he is speaking to the church in Ephesus. And by extension, he's speaking to Zion Baptist Church in this letter and through all the other letters. Isn't it awesome to think that whatever it is we're doing, the Lord Jesus Christ is surveying it. That's not to frighten us. 
But what a thrill. What a privilege. What a responsibility. That the God of all creation and the person of the Son of God stands in the midst of this church surveying the scene. He walks around his churches. And so here he is about to tell them something really quite powerful and important. He pinpoints the issue in verse 4, and this is the whole purpose for this letter in verse 4. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Imagine this. Moving in the midst of his people. And the reason that he's writing to this church is because they have left their first love. The church that was started in the way we've just described through this apostolic ministry where signs and wonders attended, where the ministry went out beyond Ephesus, a church that was an example of what it was to be uh, an apostolic church. You read the letter to the Ephesians and it's the most beautiful thing. And here is Christ saying to them, you've left your first love or you've lost your first love. I'm sure they would have been absolutely shocked to hear that. I'm sure it, it, it really uh, stunned them to hear these words. After all, look at what he says about them. He makes some observations about them in the first couple of verses. Jesus is fully aware of everything they do. He says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars and has borne and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. What a wonderful commendation of this church, you would think. Jesus is telling them, I see everything you do, all your works, and I see how hard you work at these things. It's not just work, it's labor. You're putting in effort. You're persevering. You're patient. He's saying you're doctrinally orthodox. Thou canst not bear them which are evil. And you've tried them which say they are apostles and are not and has found them liars. You see, they had a solid doctrinal basis upon which that church was built. Apostolic foundations laid in that church. And Jesus says, you have been doctrinally orthodox and you've understood the need to be because it's enabled you to identify and reject false teachers and their teaching. You've kept it going for my name's sake. The pastor of the church 35 or 40 years before, Timothy, was instructed to teach men 
so that they would then be able to teach others. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. To teach men the doctrine that he had been taught by the Apostle Paul. And to teach to others who would have that ability to then tell other men. But here we are. And Jesus is saying to them, you've lost your first love. I mean, that is amazing. Because we're here today, and I want to say this, isn't it really important for us to be doctrinally correct as much as we can be? Isn't it so important for us to be the kind of church that is active and working and laboring in the service of God? Isn't it so important for us to be able to understand what we believe, to know what we believe, so that we can then refute those who come against us? So important that we are eager to get involved in the Lord's work, properly motivated, as we'll come on to in a minute. Yet we need to recognize the danger that Jesus highlights in verse 4. I always find this shocking, but it's true. You've lost your first love. You've, you've, you've moved away. You've left thy first love, even in all of your activity even in all your doctrinal correctness, even in all your determination to identify and reject false teaching. You've left me, says Jesus. Because you see, all of that is wonderful. All of that is correct and right and appropriate. And it should be a desire and a determination in us to be these things and to do these things. But we can be these things and we can do these things. And at the same time, we have left the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't ever want to lose the love that we have. Someone said last week to me, that Christianity is a romance. A million kisses to you, Jesus. We are melted by the kisses of his mouth. And we return those, that love to him. but we can be all of what Christ has said to the church in Ephesus in these verses so far. We can be all of these things and forget to give him a million kisses, to forget his love for us that stokes in us this deep love for him. So Jesus says to them, you've forgotten your first love or you've left your first love. This is the one that's been standing in their midst. Has he been standing in their midst alone? Has he been standing in the midst of the church that know all the doctrine, have all the works? Has he been standing in the midst and no one has come to him to offer him the love of their heart? They used to. Does that not just make you sit up this morning? That we be careful. Because this church loves the Lord Jesus Christ. The pastor beforehand clearly 
didn't just love the Lord Jesus Christ. He was in love with the Lord Jesus. And that's what we must be. We must be in love with him. And make sure that nothing else that we do, important though it is, gets in the way of our heart telling his heart that we adore him just because he is Jesus. Just because he is who he is. Do you feel that this morning? Do you, are you sitting here this morning and your heart has, uh, you don't feel this? Do you not feel this love for Jesus? Then we need to hear, if that is the case, we need to hear him. Oh, you're busy, he says to them, and you're doing everything, and I'm not condemning it. You see, this is the beautiful thing about Jesus Christ here. He highlights an issue, but he isn't condemning them from, for working. He isn't condemning all the good that he sees in the midst of that fellowship. He approves of their work ethic, and he approves of their doctrinal orthodoxy, and he approves, and he doesn't condemn, but this observation is massive. Imagine being the, imagine being the Ephesians for just a moment and hearing this from Christ. It should make every single one of us take stock of our Christian walk and our Christian lives. It should make us as a fellowship be ultra diligent that the most important thing in our lives and in this fellowship is a continued adoration of Jesus Christ. We know that is true here, but we must make real effort to make sure that as we go into the future because we are going into the future that we go into the future working hard for christ guarding the doctrines that we believe in holding strong to these things so that we can be protected from wrong influences. But as we go into the future, we must make sure that despite all of that, our first priority is that Jesus knows that our hearts and his heart are united in love. There is no one more precious in this fellowship, nor should there ever be, than the Lord Jesus Christ. No pastor, no elder, no one more important than the one who stands and moves in our midst, the one who's the head of the church, the one who died for us. You see, he, Jesus took action. And the reason Jesus took action was because he was driven by love. He took action to reach out to you and to me, sinners, to save us by grace. He took action because he was driven by love. We don't take action because we're driven by doctrine, precious though it is. So don't, please do not ever hear me saying anything other than we should be doctrinally sound. That the doctrines of grace are precious. Don't ever hear me say that. But you weren't saved because you understood a doctrine. You were saved 
because Almighty God loved you so much that he gave Jesus Christ to be your sacrifice, to atone for your sin. Folks, if you don't know who Jesus Christ is this morning, if you're here and you don't know who the Savior is, this is who the Savior is. The Savior is an acting God. He, he takes action. He's an active God. He is a proactive God. His heart beats with love for those he will save. And he has gone to Calvary for those he will save. Do you hear this great voice this morning in the midst of this church? Do you hear his voice speaking to your heart? Oh, I pray that you do. Because he's taken action. Jesus took action on the cross because of his love for us. And, 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 and while he commends them for their action, there was something missing from their works and their labor. And it was a love of Jesus. It was love. It was, it was works that had been done from a position of, of, a, of a, a love that had waned. You see, we can keep going. That's one of the remarkable things about the church. And I use that term as a title, not the true church. I'm talking about the church. The remarkable thing is we can keep going. We can keep gathering. We can have great numbers. And yet we could still hear Jesus saying, while we celebrate these things, we could still hear Jesus saying, you've left your first love. I see all of that. I accept all of the effort you've put in. I'm not denying it. I'm saying it hasn't come from here. I don't know about you, but that really makes me sit up. Because who is it we're doing it for? We don't serve God. We don't call it Christian service. Like this Ephesian church, Jesus says that they've labored and has not fainted. But before that, he has said, for my name's sake. So here they are, all that they're doing, they're attaching the name of Christ to it. Lord, Lord. Didn't we do this in your name? And what did he say? Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. You see, we can be filled, we can be busy, we can be doing all that. We can be even holding true, solid doctrine, and we are away from him. Don't, we can't ever get there. We mustn't ever get there. Oh, we need to serve, but we need to serve out of love. You know, many of you probably read or have read um, Oswald Chambers. And he talks about service. And he says, service is the overflow of superabounding, superabundant devotion. Because that makes service sacrificial. It's not enough to just do things because it's what you think you should do. As a gathering of people who claim his name, we should be so devoted to Jesus Christ, and we are, but I'm, I'm trying to put this before us as we go out into the future to keep a reminder, a reminder before us that as we go out into the future, we, everything we do should be sacrificial for Jesus. How did he serve us? Driven by love. He served us in a sacrificial way. He went to the cross at Calvary. He shed his blood for us. And so when we serve him, we should serve sacrificially. It should mean something to us. It should cost us something even. 
Wouldn't it be horrible to hear Christ say, you've left your first love? Because he's talking about himself. You've left me. Ah, don't ever want to hear that. And I'm sure there have been times in my life and maybe in yours where the Lord could have come up to us and said, who are you actually doing that for? Are you doing it for yourself? Or are you doing it for me? We can do the work of the Lord for our own sakes. One of the first times it hit me really quite clearly was someone said to me oh, years ago now, we need to do this or we need to do that. I'll not tell you anything other than that because it would identify. We need to do this so that the church continues for the next 10 years. If that's your idea of serving God, forget it. God is not asking us or any fellowship, nor is he, was he asking the Ephesians to work, work, work to satisfy and guarantee their future. Work, work, work because you love me and I, says Jesus, will satisfy your future. He will build his church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He will use our service, our work, our efforts in doing that, but those works and efforts come, don't they, from loving him. I just feel this message, God wants us to hear this message today because we're not going back that way. We're going forward under his authority. And he wants to make clear that as we go forward, we go forward loving him. And everything we do is because we love Jesus. So I'm going to ask a question, and you don't need to answer, but I'm just going to ask you this question right now. Do you love Jesus? Yes, we should say. Are you in love with Christ? Is he what you think about? Is he the one you want to please? Is he the one you want to fall down before and give everything to? We need to make sure that we don't leave our first love. In Psalm 40, in verse 8, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. I delight to do thy will, O my God. What makes a, a Christian delight to do the will of God? What makes a believer delight to do the will of God or a church delight to do the will of God is love for him. Service can become a burden and bothersome when we're doing it out of duty. But when we're doing it because we love the one we serve, it's delightful, even when it's hard. I'm sure the, the Elders in the church can testify to that. What is it that's driven the elders to hold the church? What's driven the elders to lead the church? Duty, simply. Well, I want to tell you that isn't true because if it has only been duty, they wouldn't be here because they would have crumbled under the weight it's been love for Jesus Christ. 
even although some of the folks might not have recognized that. Isn't it precious when we love him? The things that we will do for him, the things that we will put up with for him. Not because someone's telling me I must, but because my heart belongs to the man of Calvary who won it from me. Yes, we love Jesus and we want to continue to adore him and, and serve him out of that love. But he doesn't leave it there. He doesn't leave it there. He says, remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen. So if your heart has grown cold or is growing cold, then that's a word, isn't it? Remember where you used to be. Remember how you used to be. Remember what you did because you loved me. He says, do the first works. What were the first works? What are the first things we did when we, when we came to know Jesus? I remember getting up in the morning, before four o'clock in the morning, with my Bible open. I'd just been saved. Reading my scriptures, reading the scriptures, praying to God and couldn't wait till the next day to get up and do the same. And those are the works in the word, in prayer, around the Lord's table. <coughs> Fellowship with one another. Couldn't wait to get to a church and I get saved. These are the things we did because suddenly we realized God loved us and, and our hearts were full of love for him. And the only way that we could find to express that was being in his word, listen to what he has to say, enjoying fellowship with like-minded people, hearing the sons and daughters of God crying out to him in prayer. That was marvelous. Oh, let me say this, that wasn't just Whenever I get saved, I cannot wait to get to this place for the meetings that we hold. I cannot wait. I love the fellowship with one another. Love it. I love to hear my brothers and sisters when we gather on a Wednesday and on a Friday speaking to the one that they adore. And you can hear that adoration. It thrills me like a, I'm a newborn babe. But you see, there's a great danger. that things can cool. Oh, God, you know, do that. Don't allow it to happen. You're going to promise that with me, that we will not allow that to happen. That as we go into the future, we will do all we can to maintain our devotion to Jesus so that if we, every step we take will be a step of love for the Savior. Because he doesn't leave it there. He said, or else, 
We don't want to hear Jesus saying that. We really don't want the Lord God Almighty to say or else. That is really quite a sobering couple of words to come from the divine mouth. I don't know, maybe you're like me, but I can't count on my, I just cannot count the number of times I've said to my kids or else. But when Almighty God says it, completely different, isn't it? He says, you do what I'm telling you to do in order to restoke that flame of love and devotion. He says, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick. In other words, they would no longer be a bona fide church. That's the threat or the warning from Christ. So what we need to do then to step beyond that is to commit ourselves to a life of devotion to Jesus and let everything else we do as a fellowship just flow out of that love so that our service carries with it the fragrance of the love we have for Jesus Christ. Because there's a reward coming. He that hath an ear, let, the, let them hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. To eat of the tree of life is going to be our great privilege as overcomers. This is a blessing that Adam was meant to have. And he didn't know anything about it. He didn't experience it because he didn't go to the tree of life. He went to the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We are going to be allowed to eat of that beautiful fruit that Adam never tasted when we overcome. As believers who overcome, as we live our lives overcoming everything, filled with love for Christ. Lord Jesus, we absolutely adore you. Lord, we recommit ourselves to a life of devotion given over to who you are. May our love for you, Lord Jesus, add a special flavor to our service for you. For we ask it in your holy name. Amen.